Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. If you turn there and stand for the reading of God's word, let's stand as we read the word of the Lord. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. Not only in this age but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. Which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. May God add his blessings to his holy word. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you are glorious. And God, we ask that as we come to your word, we would, uh, y- your spirit would do what we first sang when, when we gathered here together, that God, you would open the eyes of our hearts so you would see and experience you. God, help us to know and feel these things that you have for us this morning. God, help me to just speak plainly. God, you'd hide me behind your cross. Lord, as we, as we go into your word, God, I pray that you'd fill us up. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. You may be seated. How many of you have ever been to the Grand Canyon? How many of you have ever been? That is way more than I expected. I'm going to be honest with you. Can you put your hands back up again? So jealous. I have never been to the Grand Canyon. I really want to go to the Grand Canyon. Um, I've been told that it's, it's the kind of thing, and I'm going to guess everybody whose hand is up is going to agree with me on this, but I've been told that it's the kind of thing that if you see it in a picture, that's a picture of the Grand Canyon, if you see it in a picture or you read about it in a poem or something like that, it does not do it justice. That you can't really understand it and feel it unless you go there and just be like, whoa. Right? How, how many of you would agree? Like, that's, that's, that's it. Yeah, everyone who raised their hand saying the same thing. And so all of us that haven't been there, I'm so sorry. Right? In Ephesians chapter 1, in Ephesians chapter 1, the first 14 verses that we've gone over the past two weeks that Pastor Dave's taken us through, Paul's kind of like blasted us with, with what I would call the Grand Canyon of Theology. Right? If you go to Romans, Romans is sometimes called the Mount Everest of theology in the Bible. If you go to Ephesians, it, I, I would consider that the Grand Canyon of theology. It's huge, and it's filled with so much good stuff. Think about the number of things that Paul just blasted us with in those first 14 verses. He talked about the nature of what it means to be in Christ, to be chosen and predestined according to God's will for salvation. That was big. To have redemption through the blood of Jesus, to be sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. These are big, big, awesome truths. And by the way, you you might not know this, he did that in verses 1 through 14 in one Greek run-on sentence. It's one big, long sentence. It's just him just like, blah, here you go. And then this morning, what he's doing in 15 through 23, it's another just big run-on sentence. He kind of likes them. English teachers hate them, but he likes them, all right? And what he's doing here, though, is a little bit different. He's not adding anything new. Instead, what he's praying, he's praying for the church. He just gave them these amazing theological truths, and now he's praying that we would know them and we would feel them. Have the eyes of your hearts enlightened. He's praying that the Spirit would open us so that we would know and feel these things he just mentioned, right? And I love that because theology is is important, Amen? We should, we should know theology, right? We should, we should talk about predestination and election. We should talk about the atonement and the trinity. We should talk about the hypostatic union of Jesus and how he's God and man at the same time. We should talk about ecclesiology. That's the study of the church. We should talk about the end times, eschatology. We should talk about all... We should talk about infralapsarianism versus supralapsarianism. 
Maybe we don't actually need to talk about that one. Um, you can have fun Googling it later, though, all right? We, we, should, we should, as a church, we should be growing in these things and knowing these things. But here's the thing. Theology should never be, first of all, it should never be just big, long words, okay? But it should also never be just something that we do in our head for fun. It's not just a fun intellectual exercise. In fact, that's dangerous. It is a dangerous thing for theology to just be in the head because it leads to swollen-headed Christians with small hearts that hurt people, to be quite honest. It leads to swollen-headed Christians that walk around in arrogance and call foul on things that they have no busy calling, business calling foul on. It, it leads to this kind of arrogant bravado, all right, that, that this swollen-headed Christian. At the same time, we got to be careful because we love Christians that have big hearts that, that just want to love the Lord and love everybody and do everything. And that's awesome, but you cannot just have a big heart and, and a head that doesn't care about theology either because that's just as dangerous. Because now may, maybe I've got all this ambition to go and serve the Lord and love people and do these amazing things, but I'm going to run the risk of misrepresenting God and misleading myself and misleading others, and that's not good either. So what, what's the point? The point is that God wants our heads and our hearts full of him. He wants our heads and our hearts full of theology, full of the study of him and the knowing of him, right? And so this morning, that's exactly what our goal is. Our goal is to, to hope that Paul's prayer would be true for us and we would actually know and we would feel these deep things, why? So that, so that though, as we know them and we feel them, they'd come out of our hands and we'd actually maybe do them, right? We'd do them. And, and that's important. Like James, you read James. We understand that, right? In James it says, hey, don't just be hearers of the word, be doers of the word, right? And that's, and that's true. Now, here's the problem, though. Knowing the truths of God, that's, I think we get that. Y'all probably go to Bible study if you don't. Why not? Okay. All right, go to Sunday school, right? We study the word on our own. We want to know the truths of God. Doing things because we know the truths of God. Doing things like I read, hey, help the poor. Okay, I need to go help the poor, right? Hey, forgive each other. Okay, I need to go forgive. Like doing things, that, that makes sense to us. It's this middle one that we're going to focus on today that I got to be honest with you, I have struggled with all week. And that is the feeling I've been struggling with this question all week is, how do I get you and myself to feel these things? I don't, I don't like that task. And the good news is that I don't have to, and I, and I can't, right? Because even Paul, when he prays, he's praying that the Spirit would open the eyes of our hearts, right? And so I, I'm going to kind of suggest to you as we dive in here that as I'm preaching that you would you would pray along with Paul. You kind of imitate him and ask him to do this. Ask the Spirit to open the eyes of your heart so you would feel this. You might be saying like, John, I've been in church a lot longer than you have. I don't need to feel. No, we always, we always need to be feeling more. We always need to be knowing more. There's not necessarily, if you've been in the church a while, going to be a lot of things that are new here, all right? For some of you, it might be new, and that's great. We're glad you're here. But we're, we're, our hope is that we would feel these things. We'd know them, we'd feel them, and then, of course, we'd live them out. So what are the three things that Paul prays for? He prays conveniently for three things. Um, the first thing he prays for is this. Paul wants us to know and feel the hope of God's calling. He wants us to know and feel the hope of God's calling. Now, now by calling, I think he's referring to the gospel, I think he's referring to the good news, right? The, the call of the gospel says, hey, come everybody to the feet of Jesus who has lived the perfect life. He has died the death that we all deserve, and he's risen from the dead. He's defeated death, and so we can call on him to be saved, right? So the first thing we've got to do with that, of course, is we have to believe that. And if, if you're in here this morning and you don't believe that, listen, you need to. Why, why, would you, why would you leave not knowing that you believe in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross to save you from your sins? But Paul's going a little deeper here. He wants us to know the hope of the gospel. The hope, what kind of hope does the gospel offer? That's a big question. There's a lot to that, isn't there? There's a lot of things that the gospel offers in terms of hope, right? What kind of hope does the gospel offer? It offers hope of eternal life, hope of forgiveness, hope of reconciliation, hope of sanctification, hope of justification, hope of glorification. It offers all of that, 
right? But there's one thing that, that I think the gospel offers in terms of hope that we all experience every single day, and, and I, and I want to focus in on that one. Now, I, like, justification is a great one. But I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not the best Christian. I don't think about my justification. I don't wake up and go, huh, I'm justified. And I don't do that every day. Maybe you do, and you're better than I am, okay? But there is something I think all of us, whenever we do this, we, we think about the hope that the gospel brings, and that is this. Freedom from sin. Freedom from sin. One of the, one of the things that the gospel gives us in terms of hope is one day, sin is done. And I know. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Do you ever think about that? You ever, you ever have that kind of day or that week or that month or that year where you're like, man, I, I stink, you know? And, and, you, and you realize, like, God, one day, this is going to be done. Like, I'm not going to struggle with this anymore. There's going to be no temptation to it. My flesh isn't going to desire it anymore. Your word makes it clear. One day, the temptation to sin is done. Oh, it's going to be good. It's going to be so good. But that's then. What about now? What am I supposed to do now? I mean, that makes me happy for then. But right now, it's like, what am I supposed to do? Well, just wallow in your sin and, and hopelessness, right? Like, no, what are you supposed to do right now? Well, the Bible tells us what we're supposed to do. You don't, if you know for some reason that tomorrow the game you're playing, you're going to win, you know the score, you don't go to the game and not play your hardest. You go to the game to win, right? You go to the game to, to finish, right? Even if you know what the score is going to be. And so, that's what God's word tells us to do. Hey, what do we do with this sin? Even if we know it's going to be defeated one day, what do we do with it? Well, we hate it, and we fight it, and, and Paul tells us we, we put to death the deeds of the body, the deeds of the flesh, right? We put these things to death. We be killing sin, John Owen famously said. We be killing sin unless it be killing us, right? We be dealing with it. Psalm 119 kind of tells us how we do that. How do we do that? The secret, it's not a big secret. Psalm 119 kind of tells us. It says... I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. How do we do it? We do it by taking the word of God and putting it in our heads and putting it in our hearts. That helps us battle sin, right? Now, what kind of word do you need to have in your head and your heart? What kind of word do we need to be putting into us? How about, how about God's word when it convicts us and it says, hey, don't do that. Is that the kind of scripture we should put in? Yeah. Actually, that, that's good stuff. Law, laws are good to put in us. How about, how about God's word when it says things like, like, uh, like warns us of the consequences? When it's like, hey, if you do that, this is what's going to happen. Those are good too. We should memorize those. We should put those in us, right? But is that it? No, there's also some hope that the gospel brings. There's some hope that scripture brings that we should put in us. I'm going to, let's do an example. Let's use, let's use an example. Let's pick a sin and use an example, all right? Let's pick sexual sin. Why am I picking that one? Just to make you uncomfortable, all right? That's it, all right? Sexual sin, sexual immorality. It's big in the Bible, okay? It's like God knew, okay? All right, what do, we, what do I do? What scripture do I memorize to help me battle sexual sin? How about 1 Thessalonians 4.3? You can't go wrong with 1 Thessalonians 4.3. See some of you nodding in, in here in the room like, yep, all right? That's a good one, right? Why? This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like people who don't know God. That's good. Memorize it, write it on a note card, tape it on your computer. Good. Do battle, Right? What's another one we can memorize? How about 1 Corinthians 6, 9, right? This, this one's scary, right? Puts the fear of God in us. Do not be deceived. The sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. Yikes. Memorize it. Journal it. Crochet it on a pillow. Throw it on the couch, all right? That's, why not, all right? God's word says, put the scripture in the door frames of your house and everyone's like, why not? That's a good one. All right. 
If I go into one of y'all's house one day and you have that on the couch, I will be your best friend forever. That is so cool. And if you have teenagers, even better. That, that's even funnier. That's a good one. These are good. They're convicting. Hey, we're sinners. We need that kind of reminder. We need to preach to ourselves the word of God and like convict and, and do that. But is that all we need? No, we also need some hope. What are the scriptures that give hope to the person struggling with sexual sin? How about Psalm 1611? You make me know, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, God, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Yeah, that'll, that'll preach, right? Like I'm struggling with sexual sin and, and, I, real, and I think, man, one day I'm going to be at the right hand of God and I'm going to be at his hand and there are pleasures forevermore. Pleasures that make this seem like trash because it is trash. So why would I deal with it? What about James when it says, hey, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you? Yeah, that helps, doesn't it? That gives me hope because every time I draw near to sexual sin, it just flies away from me and teases me and says, hey, come a little closer. Whereas if I come near to God, God just draws near to me. Amen? What, what, about, what about Psalm 90, verse 14, when it says, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, O God, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Yeah, that's so good. Every morning, I don't need to be satisfied with this. I can be satisfied with him. I can be satisfied with the love of God. Do you see how that gives the hope to us? That's what gives us hope. So, so the question to Paul's first prayer here is, is Christian, do you, do you know and do you feel the hope of the gospel? Do you know it and do you feel it? Second thing Paul, Paul prays for us is this. He wants us to know and feel the riches of God's glorious inheritance in the saints. That's a mouthful, right? By, by inheritance, he means heaven, okay? By inheritance, he means heaven. One day, we're going to inherit the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, all right? God himself, in, in many ways. It's a gift for believers that we're going to receive one day, and it's amazing, and I can't wait for it. Can you? It's going to be good. We've all speculated about heaven, haven't we? we all, we've all thought questions about what heaven's going to be like, right? Questions like, is there going to be a line? <laughs> Do I have to stand in line to meet Jesus? I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I don't know how it works, but God can do anything. There will be no lines. I hate lines, so I don't think they're going to be there. I'm just going to say that. That's not in the Bible. I'm just saying I don't like lines. It's the worst part about Universal Studios, standing in a line. All right? It's the worst thing ever. It's not going to happen in heaven. Somehow, we'll all get to stand right next to him. I don't know how, but it's going to happen. Right? Is there going to be a gate? Do I get wings? No, you don't. Okay? What's up with halos? How do those work? Is my cat going to be there? Probably not. Cats are evil. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. They are. They're, they're not good. Cats are not good. I'm sorry. If you love cats, they might be there. We, we've entertained questions like that about heaven, and we've thought about those things. We've speculated. But can we go deeper than that? I, I hope we can, because that's the whole point, right? Because Paul's saying, I want you to know the riches of God's glorious inheritance. I want you to know about heaven. And what's funny about that is heaven's one of those things that we think is this big mystery. But Paul's saying, I hope that you get it. I hope that you understand it even more. I hope you delve the riches of it. Jonathan Edwards said this. I love this. You thought you were done with Jonathan Edwards' quotes. <laughs> labor to get a sense of the vanity of this world. And labor much more to be acquainted with heaven. I like that. I like that. For our three-year anniversary, Sarah got me a watch. It's nice. It's wood. It's made out of wood, right? It's a nice watch. And uh, on the back of it, she got something engraved. And it says, three years, I love you more with every second. I know. I know. There's just one problem. It doesn't work. <laughs> Now, it worked when she got it for me. 
I promise you, it worked when she got it for me. I've worn it like every day since she got it for me, but just recently it just stopped ticking. And I was like, ah. So I changed the battery and it started working for like a minute and then it stopped. I was like, oh man. And I was so upset. And so now I've got to take it to professional and maybe he'll be able to fix it. Um, but, uh, but maybe he won't. And, and maybe this will just end up becoming like, you know, a token of my wife's love that I just leave on the nightstand, right? Um, but that's okay. Why is that okay? That's okay because this is temporary and it's going to break someday anyway. Especially since it's wood, right? But the love of my wife is not temporary. It's still ticking, praise God, okay? That's still going. Now, why do I say that? Because I think that is what Paul like, kind of has in mind in 2 Corinthians 4 when he talks about heaven some more. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, they're temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Now, what is, what is Paul trying to say there in, in our passage this morning? I, I think what he's trying to say is this. He wants us to know and to feel the riches of this internal inheritance that we're going to have so that we can better deal with the things we've got now. The more correctly we think about eternity, the more correctly we'll think about all the stuff we have right now, right? In as much as all of us have probably pondered, like, what is heaven going to be like? We've also probably pondered this. What would it be like if I was a millionaire? We've all wondered that question, right? Like, imagine this for a second. Imagine next month you knew, you knew next month you're getting a million dollars. You knew it. There's, it's guaranteed. I don't know why, but it is. It's guaranteed. All right, next month you're getting a million dollars. What would change in your life from this day to that day? I, some of you are like, nothing. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Everything would change. The way you spend would change. The way you give would change. The way you think about stuff would change. Things would break. You'd be like, <laughs> I can get 50 more. All right? You would, everything would change. Everything would change. And here, here's, the, here's the deal. Listen, one day, every believer in this room, you're going to inherit the kingdom of God. You're going to inherit heaven. Everything. Everything is going to be yours. I'm not saying that in a weird way, by the way. I'm saying that because that's what Scripture tells us. One day we're going to be inheritors of the kingdom of God. And we worry about money. Why? One day you're going to have it all. And there's going to be no want or need for anything. Right? We worry about our health. One day I'm going to have a body that does not decay. We worry about dying. One day I'm going to live for all eternity. We worry about how much we can give. Jesus said, store up treasures in heaven. What did he mean by that? He meant everything you give right here and now for the glory of God, you're just going to get it back. It's just going to be treasures in heaven. Do you see what Paul's getting at? He said, I want you to know that and feel that, the riches of your glorious inheritance. One day you're going to have it all. So why are you worried about what you don't have now or what you do have now? Why do we hold on to things so preciously? That's what he's getting at. So, so saints of God, do you know and do you feel the rich inheritance that is yours in Christ Jesus? Final thing, Paul wants us to know and feel, and this is a big one, the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward us who believe. Huh. A little bit of history. So Ephesus um, is a, it was a place at this time that was very religious, very superstitious. Um, they dabbled in a lot of different occult stuff, magic stuff, and they were very familiar with a lot of different powers. We know that from uh, Acts 19. In Acts 19, there's actually this story of the sons of Sceva. It's really funny. After church, you should go and read it. Um, but the sons of Sceva are, are essentially their uh, amateur Jewish exorcist. 
emphasis on the amateur. And they see Paul um, exercise a demon, and, and they're like, oh, we can do that. And so they go up to a man that's demon-possessed, and they try to do it. And the man that's demon-possessed looks at him and is like, I know Paul, and I know Jesus. Who are you? And then he beats him up, right? <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny, all right? And he beats him up. And, uh, and then that causes a lot of people in Ephesus to take their magic books and the things they thought were powerful and to burn them. And to, and to get rid of them. It's kind of, kind of a cool story. So what we know is that Ephesus was very familiar with different powers. We are very familiar with a lot of different powers, things that we think are powerful. And we're also very familiar, like the Ephesians, with the fact that those powers don't always pan out, right? Money is something that we think can be very powerful, and it can be, except it doesn't last, and it can't buy everything. Politics is a power a lot of people try to trust in, except it keeps changing hands every few years, right? And everyone's gotten a different opinion of how it works, and it just seems to be a lot more arguing than doing, right? And it doesn't seem to get a whole lot done. Or if it does get stuff done, it's never stuff that we agree with, right? Physical strength is a power a lot of people trust in. A lot of people trying to get swole nowadays, right? All right, physical strength is the power a lot of people try, but it fades. I saw a video this week of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Terminator. Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he's 72 years old now. 70, the Terminator is 72 years old. And, and he's still kind of fit, but the video was him in his Gold's Gym in California, and, uh, and he's like working out, and it's fine. It's like, okay, that's cool. But he's surrounded by pictures of him when he was 20 and this giant statue in the middle of the gym of him as Mr. Olympia, you know, that thing. And I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, that'd be really awkward. I hate, because he doesn't look like that anymore, guys. He, he, he still looks good. For a 72-year-old, he looks great, okay? But he, he doesn't look like Mr. Olympia anymore. Even the Terminator, strength doesn't last. So, so the question is, how do we know that God's power is any different? If we, if we were to go on and on and on, every single power we can think of, we know it doesn't last. It doesn't always work. So how do we know God's power is any different? Paul addresses that right away by explaining what kind of power this is. And it's incredible. What is this power? He says it's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. It's resurrection power, as we've sung about before. And here's the the crazy thing. Paul is saying, this resurrection power is toward you who believe. It's for you who believe. In what way? Well, in one sense, one day Jesus has been raised from the dead. Therefore, all of us who trust in him, we one day will be raised from the dead. We'll have new bodies. We'll be with God for eternity in heaven. That's awesome. But again, that's, that's future. What about right now? There's resurrection right now, too. Look at, look at Romans 6, 4. Look at this. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we, too, might walk in newness of life. In other words, here's what Paul's saying. The resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead is for you right now so that you would walk a risen new life that's totally different from anything that this world has to offer. That in other words, the whole idea that the power, man, what kind of power would it take to rise Jesus from the dead? That same power is in every believer to live a totally different, weird, new, crazy life before this world. And that's what God wants for us. Christian, God, God wants you to cast off the old self, put on the new self. God wants you to use the gifts that you have to do amazing things for his kingdom now. Not sometime in the future, right now. That's what he has for us. How do we do that? Honestly, that's a whole sermon series. How do you walk in newness of life? We could talk for like days about that. But from our text, I'll, I'll tell you one little thing that Paul, I think Paul gives us. How do I walk in the newness of life in resurrection power? How do I do that? I don't do it alone. 
I don't do it alone. What do I mean by that? Follow with me. If you look at the end in, in verse 21, what Paul uh, does is after he says Jesus has been raised from the dead, and he says Jesus has been seated at the right hand of God, he says that he's far above all rule and authority, that Jesus is above every power and dominion. He's above every name that's named. And God has put everything in creation under Jesus' feet. And God has made Jesus, listen to this, the head over all things to the church. And what's the church? The church is his body. The church is his body. I, I want to use that to make, at the end of the sermon here, to, to, make, um, to make the first application, okay? And, and, I, and this one, I think, is personal to faith church, okay? Um, the, every body, every body, every group of believers is a body of Christ, okay? The church globally is the body of Christ, but we also in here, we are members of the body of Christ. And every church has a head, has a head. Literally what I mean by that is body, head, okay? Has a head. The head, though, of every church is who? Jesus. Jesus. And the body needs each other, and it always needs the head. Without the head, it doesn't work. Now, why am I bringing this up to us? Because in a little while, we pray in a little while, we're going to have a new pastor. And I'm excited for this. I'm really excited about the, the team that's uh, the search committee. You guys are doing an amazing job, and we're praying for you, and we love you. Thank you. Um, but in a little while, we're going to have a new pastor. And I want us to be careful that we do not burden him with being the head of faith church. Do you understand what I'm saying? I want us to be careful that we don't burden him with being the head because he's not the head. Pastor Dave is not the head. Pastor Anthony is not the head. No elder is ever going to be the head of faith church. The head of faith church is always and forever going to be who? Jesus. Now, he, th this man that comes, he, he's, uh, we pray that he's going to be an amazing preacher, that he's going to have the, the gifts to be able to speak to us and, and feed us the word of God. We pray that he's going to be a good leader. But as much as he leads, he answers to the head. And he is not in charge of the whole thing. Jesus is in charge of the whole thing. And, and I, I just think that's important for us to remember. And because we're going to be fed by Pastor Dave and Anthony and whoever comes onto the stage, that we're going to be fed by the gifts that they have, right? As we, people that exist on this stage, walk in the newness of life, we're going to use our gifts to try to feed you guys and to feed ourselves, and that's really, really good. But here's the thing. We also need you. You also need everybody in this room because that's the way the church works. The church works in that we need you to be comforting. We need you to pray. We need you to pick up. We need you to build up. We need you to, to tear down like walls over there. We need you to, to do things. We need you to give. We need you to love. We need you to encourage. We need you to do this. If you don't do that, the body isn't working. And every pastor here is just another member of the body. And we all need the head. Does that make sense? One of the ways we walk in the news life is we walk together. Not answering to any man, we walk together. Right? We walk together answering all of us to Christ. Second application is this. I said at the beginning that I, I would I encourage you all to pray as we went through this. That God would open the eyes of your hearts to, to feel these things. And I hope he did. I hope he did. But maybe you're sitting in here and like, I can be honest with you, I don't feel anything. This is great, but I don't feel anything. Okay, that's fine, okay? Maybe, maybe this morning you're just like, I mean, I, know, I knew all these things, and now I know them a little better. That's it, okay? That's fine. I, I want to encourage you by just reminding you of something really important. If you look at verse 16, when Paul said he prays, he prays without ceasing. He doesn't stop praying. And so I would encourage you, I, I've been there before where the things of the scripture. I've been there before. Maybe, maybe this is you this morning. I don't know. Where I've sat in the pew and gone, I just don't feel it. This morning. I don't care. I've had that thought as a Christian. I just don't care today. I've had that thought in the middle of the week. You know? As a youth pastor, I've had that thought. Man, I just don't care. You know? Where, where is the passion? You know? It comes.
come, it doesn't come from praying once. It doesn't come from hearing one sermon. It comes from praying without ceasing. Don't stop praying and don't stop praying for each other, right? That we would know it and we would feel it and we would do it. Amen? And then finally, third application is, is very obvious. Um, if God is opening the eyes of your heart, if you're hearing about these things and you are feeling it, like, yes, yeah, the, the, the glory of our inheritance, you are hearing this, it would be so foolish for you to go out here and do nothing. So, so hear me, if, if the hope of God's calling in the gospel is gripping you today, what do you do? Go share the gospel, right? If, if the riches of the inheritance of heaven is moving you today, what do you do? Go, go start giving. Go start giving away. Start, start storing up treasures in heaven, right? If the immeasurable greatness of God's power in raising Jesus from the dead is hitting you today, then go use your gifts. Go start doing it. The most foolish thing would be for you to know this and feel this and do nothing with it. Go and do it. I have never been to the Grand Canyon. I really want to go. If any of you want to take me and my wife, we'd be very happy. Take my mom too. That'd be good. Okay. That's just sorry over there. <laughs> I've never been to the Grand Canyon. I can only imagine what it would be like. I can only imagine what it would be like. But until I go, I'm never, I'm never going to understand it. I'm never going to feel it. But Jesus has already come. He's already lived. He has already died. He's already risen. He is already there for you to call on, to believe in, and to know and feel what he can do in your life right now. You don't, and you don't have to go anywhere. Amen? Amen. Would you please uh, stand for the benediction? After the benediction and the final hymn, uh, the elders are going to be down over here. If you need to pray uh, this morning, um, if you need to accept the uh, Lord Jesus into your life, then please, please come talk to an elder. Pray about anything. We'd, lo we'd love to talk with you. And then uh, the deacons are going to be right over here if you have any financial issues or you need any help. Please hear the benediction. May the God of glory enlighten the eyes of your hearts to know the hope of his calling, the riches of his glorious inheritance, and the immeasurable greatness of his power toward you who believe. Amen.